In the mid-60s, the Department of Defense in the United States decided they needed a network, and they decided to implement the kind of technology I had been working on. And so it was decided that UCLA, my lab at UCLA, would become the first node, the first piece of the Internet. And so in 1969, that did happen. And after the first node was installed at my, at my laboratory, a second node was installed uh, at Stanford Research Institute, 400 miles to the north. And it was out of my laboratory that I supervised the transmission of the first Internet message. So what was the first message of the Internet? Do you know? You probably don't. So all we wanted to do was to log in, to connect from our computer to theirs. Now, in order to log in, we at our end have to type L-O-G, and the machine up at SRI will finish the message and type back the I-N for us because it knows exactly what we're doing. So we're ready. We have a telephone connection as well as a data connection. We type the L and we said, you get the L? Said, yep, got the L. Type the O, you got the O? Yep, got the O. Type the G, got the G? Crash. The network crashed. So what was the first message ever on the internet? Low, as in lo and behold. Imagine that you have a book and you want to send it to your friend through a postal service that only delivers uh, postcards. So what would you have to do? You'd have to tear the pages out of the book, probably have to cut them up, glue them on the postcard. Before you send the postcard, you'd notice that not every page has a page number because you cut them up and you know they could get out of order. So you number every postcard. Everything you know about postcards applies to internet packets. When you put a postcard into the Postal Service, there's no guarantee it comes out the other end. It's a best effort system. If you put two postcards into the Postal System, they don't necessarily come out in the same order that you put them in. Um, so you have a system that is, doesn't guarantee order and doesn't necessarily even guarantee delivery. Uh, then you remember that some of them may get lost, so you keep a copy just in case. And then you try to figure out, well, how do I know when I should stop sending postcards or when do I know if I should retransmit them? So you get a great idea, you have the guy at the receiving end send you a postcard every once in a while saying, I got everything up to postcard number 420. And then you re realize that his postcard might get lost. So if nothing else happens and you look at your watch and you haven't heard anything, you start retransmitting things that you'd already sent until you get a postcard saying, I got everything up to whatever it was. That's how TCP works.
first time we ever got three networks interconnected all at the same time was November 22nd, 1977. It was the first time that we'd taken three different kinds of networks and got them all to interwork with each other. It's one thing to take two nets and get them to, to communicate. You could do something funny in the middle to get it to work. But when you have three of them, you can't do that anymore. The standards actually have to work. So that was a big milestone uh, for the internet. We take for granted that, um, that, that the internet talks to itself. We have this idea that it's just this one system that's out there and it all just, you know, no. There are lots and lots of different systems. You know, people call it a network of networks. It's internet because there are lots and lots of different networks. And so what Vint Cerf did when he actually threw his gigantic brain and his incredible logical coding skills did was he got one network speaking one language, so computer language, right, to talk to another network that was speaking a different language, right? And then another one that was talking a, a different language and actually got them to communicate. At this point, it's about 1982, this is nine years into the program, and I'm now in charge of the program in the Defense Department. And we decide it is now time for everyone who was using the older protocols of the ARPANET to switch over to use the internet protocols so we can now start proliferating networks and bringing in different kinds of packet nets. So we announced at the beginning of 1982 that we are going to require everyone who is on all the research networks to start using TCP IP only. And uh, there are people grumbling about this because their email works on the old protocols and the file transfers work and the remote access works. So in the middle of 1982, in order to um, remind them that we have to make our deadline of January 1, 1983, I actually shut off on the ARPANET the ability to carry anything except TCP IP. And of course, I got lots of phone calls and complaints and angry email, and I sent back a note saying, I just wanted you to know that I can shut off the old protocols, just, just in case. So we see this you know, rapid growth of TCP IP, then it levels off in the fall, so I shut off the old protocols for two days. More grumbling and screaming and yelling, but people got the point. So by January 1, 1983, almost every computer on the ARPANET switched over to the new TCP IP protocols, with the exception of one or two. Uh, now, there were only 400 computers on the internet at the time, and so this is very tiny compared to where we are today with 800 million machines that are publicly visible and probably double that that you can't see because they're only episodically connected. Uh, so that was really the birthday of the internet, January 1, 1983.